first I've had. I will not tell you why we invent English or any other natural language. It's just about constructed artificial languages that people invent much later in life. Bonan vesperon. Mi salutas vin en Esperanto. Mi nomijas Melanie. Set ne timu. Mine Darigo prelegi en Esperanto. So I'm Melanie and I like patterns and I like playing with patterns. And as a consequence, I played a lot with Lego. I got a PhD in theoretical physics and I learned Esperanto. So when I tell this to people, um, usually the reaction is, Esperanto, are you crazy? Isn't that that? Isn't that some weird thing that nobody speaks? Um, why would anybody speak it? Why would anybody even construct it? So in this talk, I will tell you um, a little bit about constructed languages in general, not just Esperanto, and why people do such a thing. So this will majorly be a huge um, collection of fun languages that people invented and reasons for it. And at the end, I will give you a very, very short crash course in Esperanto. So why do people invent languages? Um, there are three major groups of uh, constructed languages. Um, so conlangs means constructed languages. Um, Angolangs, auxlangs, and artlangs, and I will tell you uh, what all these things are. Um, but I will start on the left with the Angolangs, engineered languages, because they were kind of the ones that had their golden age first. Um, they were really, really popular in the 17th and 18th century, and they were really, really serious things. People were like deeply philosophical and scientific about them, and really wanted to accomplish something with these languages. So, um, for example, the first one, um, that I will um, tell you about as an example is um, not really very uh, modest. It's a language of the universe. It's a language that really represents the universe as it is. So when you speak it, you will really know um, what you're talking about. It will be the truth about the universe. So um, the guy who um, invented this language, uh, John Wilkins in the 17th century, he thought about it like this. Um, every word in this language should represent the concept of the word. So it's not just some arbitrary word. From the word, you will know what the word means. So in order to do this, you first need to categorize every single thing in the universe to be able to assign the correct word. So task number one, categorize the universe. <laughs> so um, here's how I went about it. Basically, a big tree of things um, that there is, so this is only the top of the tree. And um, yeah, it starts like very generically, does this work here, with the distinction of general or more abstract things like truth and special things like more concrete things, all the way going down to, I don't know, trees and tables. And then it goes down uh, this tree to every imaginable thing. And you see already a little bit uh, the time this was constructed in, so this general special distinction uh, or this uh, kind of substance accident distinction was very popular uh, in the 17th century and now seems a bit weird. Um, but anyway, so once you have such a thing and you um, have the complete tree, you have uh, everything in the world, and then you can start, okay, how do I find a word in this language? In a normal language, you would just look it up alphabetically in the dictionary. But in this language, for example, let's say I want to know how to say shit, I have to first figure out what is the concept of shit. So, so that I can go down this tree to find what, how to say it. So you can look at this tree and think about, yeah, hmm, shit, it's probably special, has to do with creatures, and yeah, you can go down uh, a long time, and then maybe you will come down here to corporeal. But actually for Wilkins, it was a type of motion. <laughs> 17th century, I don't know. So let's uh, zoom in onto the subtree that is motion there. Um, so we have uh, more stuff here, and it's uh, all very nice things like uh, belching and farting and spitting, blowing the nose. And then finally here you come a uh, dunging, shitty kind of thing. So okay, finally we found shit. That's very good. So how do we say it? Basically every category is associated with letters and make you the pronunciation. So, for example, for shit the word is seed pews, 
because it is in category 31 for motion, subcategory 4 for purgation, sub subcategory 9 from gross parts, and then S the right register. So basically, shit is a serious watery purgative motion from the consistent and gross parts from the gut downwards in this language. So that's all very great. Um, but you can see already that um, with this distinction, it's a little bit problematic that it depends highly on your background, your culture and philosophy, how you will construct this language. So when people realize this, that it's all really not that objective, they got a bit tired of this type of engineered languages and thought, okay, um, actually maybe it's the other way around. So uh, if how we think about the universe is so dependent uh, on our culture or how we think, maybe um, it's uh, even further our thought uh, is actually determined and influenced by our culture and in particular by our language. So uh, this is a linguistic hypothesis that became very popular in the 1930s, um, that the structure of language determines and influences our thought, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And uh, what does that mean? So for example, there's Orwell's novel 1984, and in this uh, novel you have the language Newspeak, and uh, this language has no word for free or freedom, uh, so um, Orwell thought that uh, if there's no such word, these people cannot even think about freedom. So that's the idea here. But it's a scientific hypothesis, so is it actually true? Can it be tested? Um, so there was a guy called James Kukubra who uh, thought, okay, we need to come up with a way to test this hypothesis. And it's not that straightforward because most languages are associated with the culture that brought these languages, like English and English culture, you can't really separate them. So he thought, okay, we need uh, artificial language, and he came up with Loglan, and Loglan means logical language. Um, and we teach people this logical language and then see whether they think more logically. So, first task, construct logical language. Um, and the idea was here we need maximum precision. So what's up with this language? In Wilkins' language we had the problem, what's the concept of the universe? In this language, you have the problem, what is the relationship between the context, or between the concepts? Because this is where the logic is. For example, look at this harmless English sentence, I woke up and drank a coffee. What do you actually mean? Okay, there's this word and, it connects concepts, parts of sentences. I woke up first and then drank a coffee. Or, did you mean, I simultaneously woke up and drank a coffee. Or, maybe, your coffee was asleep, and you meant, I woke up a coffee and drank it. <laughs> so, this problem of what you actually meant would not have happened to you in Logland, because you have at least 20 ways to say and there, and it's very precise. So, that's Logland. Um, and uh, so this is part um, of the group of engineered languages for serious reasons, and I will show you one more. Um, because not all of these languages are that serious. Because there's also a language like Tokipona in this group. It's also um, kind of with the background of the Sabir Warp hypothesis, designed by Sonia Lange in 2001. And it's a sort of simple, playful, minimalist, data zen kind of language. So it's supposed to make you think in yeah, a minimalist, data zen type of way. Um, what does it mean? Okay, so the motto of this language is Alali Pona, everything is good. And the language name is Tokibona, language good. Okay, so that's already very promising. Um, and indeed, it makes you think a little bit in this way. So for example, there are words for uh, friend, because we don't have so many words, we have to kind of combine a lot of words to make new words. So for example, friend, Jan Bona, good person. So this language is really, really difficult to call someone a bad friend, because it's a contradiction in itself. So it really makes you think uh, in a kind of positive way. So I think if uh, people uh, would speak this language, or the creatures who would speak this language, uh, should be uh, my <laughs> Okay, so uh, this was the first group I wanted to tell you about. And um, people are still constructing, constructing Engelans today, but the golden age is past. Because people, they uh, got a little bit tired of all this uh, kind of deep thinking, I think, and they wanted something more pragmatic. And in the 19th century, uh, the constructed language uh, field got dominated by auxiliary languages, Oxland, Ox, Langs, which uh, have usually idealistic background and are very pragmatic. 
And uh, this group is dominated by Esperanto because it became the most successful uh, constructed language. So Esperanto uh, was invented by Ludwig Zamenhof in the 19th century. And he grew up in an area in Poland where people spoke four different types of languages, uh, Russian, Polish, German, and Yiddish. Um, and these people, they really didn't like each other. Um, so um, Zamenhof thought, okay, uh, that must be, uh, the reason is obviously the language. So if I can come up with one language that they can all understand, they will all be happy with each other. So I need to construct a language to unite hum humanity. And this language, is, of course, has to be neutral and easy to learn, so that it will work. So uh, he constructed this language and hoped that the whole world would speak it at some point. Of course, that didn't happen, but it still became the biggest uh, constructed language so far. Uh, and how um, people speak it today, uh, how many people speak it is very difficult to estimate. Um, there, this ranges from 1,000 to 10 million people, also depending on what you mean by speak Esperanto. Um, of course, there is no country that has Esperanto as its language. However, there are a lot of Esperanto meetings every year, and Esperanto speakers call this Esperanto land. And there are people who meet in Esperanto land, uh, and uh, they get married, all without math, just with Esperanto, can also work. Um, and when they have children, they often raise them bilingually, and so they are also Esperanto native speakers. And Esperanto has translated literature, uh, original literature, uh, poems, music, films, everything. So I'll tell you a little bit more about Esperanto in the second part. But let me give you another example of auxiliary languages, which is uh, maybe a little bit more unusual. And uh, this is uh, Sol Resol. So Sol Resol was also designed to be helpful to communicate, so it was also designed to be simple in some way, and in this case by having the smallest alphabet, only seven letters or sounds. And because that's so few, you can map them to a lot of different things, in particular to the musical notes. Uh, and in Latin they're called Dormi Fa Sol La Si, so you uh, recognize maybe Sol Re Sol, which is the name of this language, and it means language, and Sol Re Sol. Uh, and it's actually kind of a neat language. It became quite popular for a while in the 19th century as a parlor trick. So um, the inventor, François Sutre, he, he traveled through Europe and gave presentations in Sol Re Sol, which were actually played on musical instruments. People found it very fun. Um, and it has these neat musical things like you can stress syllables very long and then it becomes plural. And uh, this kind of nice things. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, but nobody really learned it. That was a bit of a problem. Yeah, so this is the auxiliary language group. Um, and because none of these languages made it as a really world language, people got tired of this group a little bit too. And nowadays, people are mostly into art langs, uh, languages for art, creativity, and fun. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the last group. And this all really started uh, with Tolkien. So um, he uh, was really big into inventing languages, uh, like the Elvish and Orcish languages that you know from his books or, mo or the movies. Um, and he said about himself that he really started out with this language construction and that this whole Lord of the Rings book was basically just a place um, where he could have cultures of people, kind of people, that actually speak and live his languages. <coughs> so there would be a lot to say about Tolkien, but of course there are nowadays a lot more art lengths, like uh, you might know Klingon from Star Trek or Dothraki from, um, uh, from Game of Thrones. Um, and Dothraki uh, shows many of the typical hallmarks of these art lengths. Um, so it was uh, constructed relatively recently by David J. Peterson, and he won a, a, a contest among conlangers to be able to construct the language for this movie. And uh, it has about 3,000 words. And uh, eight words are for horse, because the Thraki are horse people. Uh, and it has no words for thank you, because they're supposed to be rough people. So that's uh, very typical for these art lengths. They are really have these quirks that are supposed to characterize the people or aliens or creatures that speak them. So this was my brief overview of our types and reasons for uh, constructed languages. Uh, engineered langs, auxiliary language, and art langs. And so now briefly part two, um, conlanging 101 or a mini crash course in Esperanto. So what do you actually need when you want to construct a language? So it's very, very important that you start with a purpose because otherwise your language will be a big model. So why do you construct this language? What do you construct it for? 
then you need sounds, you need uh, a dictionary like of words, and you need a grammar, how you put words and sentences together. So let's fill in these things by Esperanto. So the purpose was to unite the world, or maybe at least Europe. Um, and therefore, uh, we need this auxiliary language, and it has to be easy to learn, and it has to be neutral. Otherwise, it's uh, not really uniting people. So, in order to do that, um, everything else, uh, all these other points are shaped by these uh, ideas. So, sounds. Uh, Zamenhof, he took uh, 28 letters that were very well known in Europe, with sounds that were kind of well known in Europe. So, uh, Latin language, uh, Latin script. Uh, and each letter uh, represents exactly one sound, so there's never any ambiguity of writing to speaking in both ways. Uh, the dictionary also from known European languages, uh, mostly Romanic, uh, like Italian or French, because these are, have lots of words that have spread through all European languages, and also Germanic a lot because it's also big in Europe. So many words in Esperanto you will already know. And then the grammar. Of course it should not be complicated, so only 16 rules. No exceptions, um, so it should be easy, right? Um, and uh, yeah, this all seems very simple, um, but you can still construct uh, very complex sentences or anything complex in Esperanto because of what I call the Lego principle. So what do I mean by the Lego principle? Um, so let's first uh, think about, so there are two types of languages, uh, analytic languages, uh, like uh, Chinese or Tokibona, uh, and these are languages that have words all by themselves um, so the words don't get endings that confer meanings to these words, so to say. And synthetic languages, they kind of um, put stuff onto words, put words together, so that these words uh, get meanings, uh, in addition to what the root word says. So, um, for example, German is a synthetic language, so I'm German, so I had to show off this uh, great feature of German. Um, for example, there's this awesome word, Rindfleisch, Etikettierungsüberwachungsaufgabenübertragungsgesetz. <laughs> which is the Beef Labeling Monitoring Delegation Act, and it's a real German law. Um, yeah, so German can do this very well, but Esperanto can do it too. Um, and why is this helpful? Because it allows you to construct uh, a lot of new words um, from a single root, so you don't need such a big dictionary, and also you kind of always know where you are uh, with your word. So for example, the word root blue, anything that has to do with blue color, you can put some endings on it, and then it will do all kinds of nice things. So for example, the ending O will make it a noun for the blue color. And actually, O is always the noun ending. Any word ending on O is a noun. And A is the adjective ending, so blue are blue. And us is the verb uh, ending for the present tense verb. So blue us, be blue. So for example, la cielo estas blua, the sky is blue, uh, very simple English. Or you could say, la cielo bluas, um, this guy is bluing, I guess. Uh, so this is very Esperanto, that you can uh, do all kinds of words with all, uh, all roots. So you can make every root into every type of word. So the Esperanto poets use this a lot, because it can be very poetic. Yeah, and so actually this Lego principle is why I learned Esperanto, uh, because I really like uh, playing and putting things together. Yeah, so that was already my talk. Uh, I hope I gave, gave you some feeling of the fun and beautiful world of constructed languages. The engineered languages, the auxiliary languages, and the art languages. And uh, thank you.